All right, so I'm Scott Ernst, and I'm going to be talking today about the essentials of uh, effective machine learning. Uh, so a little bit about me. I'm the director of data science and engineering at a startup called When I Work. It is, it is a real company. I got up to present at a conference uh, to give a talk about a year ago, and the person that was introducing me had my bio notes, and they came over to me, and they said, uh, when they saw the company, they're like, come on, don't be smart. Where do you actually work? Uh, but it is a real company. We're located in the North Loop. We're in the Ford building right across from uh, the target, target field, and we're about 130 people. And what we do is we're reinventing employee scheduling software. So if you own a restaurant, if you run a hospital, anywhere where you're managing an hourly workforce, uh, a lot of you can, if you're old enough, remember back to how that used to be handled, which was like pen and paper or a really poor Excel spreadsheet that was posted up. And so what we've done is we've turned that into kind of the 21st century solution, the, the, the mobile phone, the mobile device. Uh, so employees are interacting with their managers and, and scheduling shifts and swapping shifts and doing all the things that an hourly workforce needs to do to, to get there on time to their shifts uh, via, via technology. So my background is I actually got a PhD in computational astrophysics. Uh, I was doing magnetohydrodynamic shockwave stability simulations. Uh, which, if anybody here knows anything about astrophysical simulation, there's no amount of computer resources that are too big when you want to be simulating stars. And so I got a pretty early look when I was in grad school at what, what big data was like and how it was forming and how it was shaping. And this is about 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, so it was pretty early on that. While I was in grad school, I started working for a startup that was doing machine learning and AI related stuff in the CG and visual effects area. And so this is an example of uh, something we did where we had a very strange uh, robotic creature that learned to walk by itself. Uh, you can see it's a little bit jerky here. We actually left a bit of the jerkiness in from the, the training process uh, to prove that it was and help people believe that it was actually generated via those types of processes as opposed to can animated by by animators. So I spent some time at that startup. Um, I did a couple other startups in the space. And then, moved on to dinosaurs. Uh, somebody that I'd been working with at that startup, which was a spin out of the university I was at for grad school, had been doing digital paleontology. And so we started to apply some of this stuff to dinosaurs and dinosaur movements. So this is an example video we did on how T-Rex could have sat down and gotten back up. That is on display at uh, the Tokyo Museum of Natural History. And I ended up doing work with uh, various museums around the country, American Museum of Natural History, Carnegie, Los Angeles, Tokyo, some additional ones in Europe, as well as NPR, National Geographic Television, uh, and others. And so we were doing that, and that was kind of uh, the fun side stuff that we were doing. And then I got pulled into, as Stephen mentioned in the intro, uh, this dinosaur data science initiative. Uh, in the early 2000s in Switzerland, they were putting in a new highway, and they uncovered the world's largest dinosaur track site, which a little piece of it looks like this. Uh, normally, when you find tracks, you'll find one, two, ten's a good find, a hundred is an amazing find. They found over 10,000. And paleontologists are really good at pulling stuff out of the ground and, and characterizing it, but there was a lot more wealth potential in this data set that they didn't know how to extract. And so I got brought in to start looking at things like behavioral characteristics of them. Were they moving in herds? Are the young protecting the adults? What, what, what can we learn? What can we understand uh, from this data? And so I spent uh, four years in, in that, on that initiative. Uh, and doing that stuff, and we'll probably be publishing for the next decade off of that. Uh, and then after that, I wanted to get back into startups, and so that's where I landed at When I Work. And when I was hired at When I Work, they had no real uh, data science team. Uh, they had been doing analytics, but they wanted to level that up. And so I came in to build a new team from the ground with very specific things in mind in terms of utilizing the data that this company had in order to, to take it to the next level. Uh, one of the key pieces of that is that 
when you're building something from scratch, you kind of have this blank check. You have to ask yourself, what are you going to do, right? And this is a couple years ago now. And what the press was talking about at the time from machine learning was places like Gartner Research saying that most machine learning projects in, in, in the world, in the real world, in the Fortune 1000, were failing to get to production, were failing to provide value, were failing to deliver the results that were initially promised. And so I, as I was taking this position, I was thinking a lot about how I could take what I had learned over the years in the, in the various ways I've been doing this kind of stuff and apply it to be effective. Because one of the key things about a startup is that you don't have, you don't have an infinite budget. Uh, you have a very small budget and, and you have very slim uh, margin if you fail. So that's what led me into really thinking about what the essentials are for effective machine learning. As I was going to form this team, as I was going to build these tools, as we were going to deploy this value into the company, what does it look like when you apply machine learning into the real world in a way that, that you, can, you can not guarantee success, but as close as you can get? So this is code freeze. It's code, so let's jump into an example really quick, uh, and let's just get started with that. So this is a very real example. I have the, the, the code up on a, a GitHub gist, so I can share that at the end if anybody wants to, wants to play around with themselves. We'll start with this in this example by loading the data. So we've got this function load data, and I've abstracted it into a function because how you load your data is very specific to whatever problem you're doing. You can be loading it from files. You can be loading it from databases, you can be loaded from big data stores, data lakes, whatever it is. You load your data, and then we're going to instantiate our machine learning model. So we've got our model here. And then the next big thing to do is we're going to fit our training data. So we've got our training features here and our training labels here. Uh, and we're going to fit those, and we've got our model fit now. So now it's time for some predictions. So the next thing we're going to do is we'll do predict off of our, our test features uh, and see what kind of predictions we get. We'll count how many of those we have correct, and then we're going to print how accurate we are. So we run that code, and we get an accuracy of 94.74%. Victory! Machine learning is easy. But wait. Here we use model. But I've heard there's this fancier model out there. I'm going to switch the model I had before with the fancier one. And I'm going to run it again. And now I get 95.66%. Improved victory. Wow, this is really awesome. This is really easy. But there's also this talk going on about this even fancier model. So we're going to try that one too. And we're going to run it again. 97.09. Even bigger victory. This is so easy. This is just great, right? This is so much success. We're going to do one more time. We're going to use the super fancy model. This is the bleeding edge. This is what everybody's talking about. This is going to be the next big thing. We're going to put it in there. 97.11% accuracy, right? Super victory. Machine learning is super easy. So now I've taught you everything you need to know about machine learning. What do you do next? The resume. <laughs> Experienced machine learning practitioner capable of solving challenging problem problems with creativity and efficiency. Let's get some of those skills up there. Expert in machine learning with model, fancy model, fancier model, and super fancy model. Owned. Let's get that resume out there and do it. Now, we're joking. You can tell we're joking. But I get resumes like this all the time. There is a pretty strong belief that this is what you need to do to be successful in machine learning these days. But what we really need to understand is that machine learning is a collection of tools and because you can use a hammer doesn't mean you can build a house. And that's the key difference, and that's the thing to really understand. So I'm going to bring in some historical perspective. The dot-com bubble, I don't know how many here remember it. Uh, some of you probably aren't even old enough to really remember it. But during that time, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything was web development. It was the E era. E this, E that. If you could create a company and put E on the front of it, you were going to be successful. And there were some huge successes and huge failures during that time. Does anybody know Boo.com? Does anybody remember Boo.com? We usually get like one or two hands. Boo.com got over $400 million 
of venture capital funding during the dot-com bubble to become Amazon.com before Amazon.com became Amazon.com. They were gonna do it first, and they failed, spectacularly. In one of the first ever post-mortems posted to the web, the CTO, Tristan Lewis, said, one of the biggest failures at Boo was to assume that web development was not a technology issue. Up through launch and beyond, the web team was first reporting to business development and then to marketing. If you go on and you look around for pictures of what the Boo.com website looked like, the homepage looked like, it's the ultimate nightmare in web development. It, looked, it really looks like marketers that didn't know what they were doing were trying to shove as much as they could possibly shove onto this site. White space, forget it, right? Like if there was a pixel, they wanted a product there that they could sell. And so it failed, even though uh, Amazon later on went to be successful in the same area. So during this time, a guy named Joel Spolsky, uh, Stack Overflow fame, Trello fame, uh, previously at Netscape and other places, uh, was seeing this kind of thing. He was right in the middle of the, in the thick of this kind of stuff. And he was thinking about software success. Uh, what, are, what, what defines a software, a successful software team? And he came up with what's called the Joel test, which is 12 simple yes or no questions to assess the quality of a software team. Prior to him posting this out, there was a giant manual on how you would assess the quality of a software team, and you would bring specialists in who would spend months consulting to see if your software team was being effective. And so he boiled it down to 12 questions, and this became very influential in the companies that came after, especially right after the dot-com crash, in terms of how they would, would, would de design and build their uh, software teams for success. A lot of this stuff, if you actually read it today, is almost like breathing for a software team. It's, it's so simple, you have to, you'd ask yourself, how could you possibly not be doing that? But at the time, these kinds of things were revolutionary. So, fast forward to 2019, and the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is machine learning and AI, right? We're in a very similar situation now to what web development was 20 years ago. And so I was asking myself when I started working at When I Work, was what is the Joel test for machine learning? What are those 12 yes or no questions that I'm gonna ask myself that I'm gonna be using to assess my team as we're getting out there and trying to deliver value? And I want to keep in mind throughout this talk that success is not the absence of complete failure. Uh, one of the things that happens a lot in the hype, and when you're on the hype curve like this, like machine learning is, is to do things that don't really fail but they, don't also, they also don't deliver value. And because we don't have good rubrics for that, what that value is, uh, we tend to assume that those aren't failures. What it really comes down to is ROI. It's just a bummer thing to talk about at a techni conf technical conference, but that's the reality of what we're talking about here. So bad ROI looks like this. If we spend $200,000 to get $100,000 back, that's pretty sad. Better ROI looks like this. We spend $200,000 and then we recoup $600,000. Awesome, we got $400,000 out of that. In machine learning, time is the investment. What you're doing for bad ROI is you're taking something that maybe took 100,000 person hours to generate $100,000 in revenue, and you're trying to bend that curve. So you may, may bend it without machine learning, but you may bend it just by working on efficiencies and performance and stuff in your workforce and get it down to maybe 60,000 hours leads to 600K, much better. We've gone from a dollar per hour to, to $10 per hour. But the idea in machine learning is that you can spend a small amount of time relatively developing a model and then that model can then go out into the real world and deliver that value at a much higher ROI. And that's what you're enabling, right? That's what machine learning is enabling. Now, it might not always be money, it might be altruistic, it might be care, it might be health, it might be, might be many things, but ultimately this is the kind of way you're looking at it, is you're trying to find something that creates a greater efficiency so that you're getting more return on your investment. So to do that, let's look at a more holistic process for machine learning, which looks like this when simplified. There's kind of six stages. There's the collection stage, the processing stage, the research stage, the development stage, the deployment stage, and the validation stage. 
And I've drawn this as a line for simplicity today, but the understanding here is that it's iterative, it's constantly going, there's back and forth, just like any process in, the, in, in a modern software era. Uh, it's not just one waterfall. But we'll look at it this way today. And what you see here immediately is that there's a lot more than the dot fit, dot predict that I showed at the beginning. There's a lot more to think about here when you're actually applying it in a holistic way to get value. Uh, there's a quote I like from Vernon Fogels, the CTO of Amazon.com, who says, 80% of what we call analytics is not analytics at all, but just hard work, which is true of so many things and is very true of machine learning. A lot of that, what we're doing isn't actually the machine learning. If you talk to a lot of data scientists, people in the field that are doing this kind of stuff, most of their job, most of their time isn't actually on the dot fit, dot predict. It's on all of that holistic process around it that makes doing that successful. So let's take a look at it in terms of degrees of execution quality. So you can have poor, okay, good. It's, it's a very basic way of looking at it, but it's sufficient for today. The ideal scenario is that you're doing all of these stages well. But there's a bunch of cases where that's not true. And I'm gonna, look, I'm gonna go through a bunch of those today and talk about the implications. The first case is called the garbage plant. The garbage plant is where you do everything well but the collection of data. Whatever data you have, that's just the data you've got, and you go and you use it, and you try to do everything else you can well, but you don't really have any control over it, you don't have any control over the quality of what's going on in that data. Which often looks like this. This is the way people think about it, is you just have totally garbage data. But that's actually not the most common case. The most common case is much more like this. You've got a lot of good data in there, but there's also some trash. There's some garbage, right? If we go back to our very real example from before, and we, we create a function that adds a 1% random noise to that data set we loaded, and we run it again, our accuracy drops from 94.74 to 81.58. That little bit of noise, that little bit of trash, that little bit of garbage has a huge impact on what we're being able to deliver, right? Now this is one of those things when you're thinking about machine learning in the real world, matters. At when I work, we do, we do a volume of about 2.1 billion events per month, which is about 1.5 terabytes of data. We're getting 1,400 events per second. Uh, two seconds after those events hit the front end of our API, they're available for use and are being used in our machine learning and all of other stuff that's going on there. And we have over 250 distinct streams for this data coming in. It's coming over from all of our app because we're, we're tracking everything that's going on. If any one of those goes bad, even a little bit, it can have serious ramifications for the downstream stuff that we're doing. So the basic tool chain to, prep, to pre prepare yourself for machine learning looks like this, ingest, store, consume, right? Those are the tools you need. But how do those tools help you overcome the entropy that I just talked about? The inconsistent and disparate data that shows up. The biases that are in that data uh, whether conscious or subconscious, whether, whether systematic or uh, human-based. I like to think about these tools as a Maslow's hierarchies in need, and these tools are food, water, and shelter. And you can survive with those tools, but you don't thrive. What you need on top of that is some kind of governance, some system that's gonna govern the data that's getting into your machine learning algorithms to make sure that it's valuable. So at When I Work, one of the things that we do is off of our ingest system where we have those 250 streams, we have an automated system that is validating those events against what we expect to see. If any of those events don't line up with that at any point in time, we quarantine them. They never make it into our system. Only the things that are validated get through to our data lake and become available for us to use. And then we have alerts and alarms on all of this stuff to very quickly and easily respond to where those problems are happening and resolve them. We also implement an immutability, which is something that you don't see enough of these days. It's, it's one of those, in the data world, it's one of those illities or, or a bulls, right? Like testability, maintainability, the stuff you'd hear about in a DevOps case. Immutability is one of those. The idea is the right once. And then you can't change the record which prevents corruption happening over time on existing data, because it's very important to be able to go back and reproduce things later in order to be able to debug. So we do those types of things to help prevent 
the garbage plant scenario. Not enough do. A second case is the silver bullet. This is where you do everything all right, but you really excel at the machine learning part. This is often called epsilon modeling. And the reason being, if we go back to our machine learning ROI, we did our 600 person hours and we get 600K out of that. And that gives us our 97.09% .09 accuracy. Well, we want to get that higher, so we're going to invest another 200 person hours and we get it to 97.11. Is that 0.02 delta adding enough additional value for the company? I like to call this Netflix envy because there are a few companies that are, have a large enough scale where a 0.02% delta might actually translate into enough dollars to be meaningful, right? They're the Googles, they're the, they're the Netflix, there are those. But for everybody else, the answer is no. Uh, I, somebody else I know likes to call it the more cowbell, if you're familiar with that reference, right? More cowbell, more cowbell, bring it on. What you actually see is this happens more often in the less successful cases. So let's imagine you've invested some amount of time and you've got an accuracy of 27.4%, which doesn't feel good. It's not adding enough value. So what you do is you do a little bit more work and you get to 27.7. Oh, not much, but there's something. There's something there, right, that's telling you, let's keep pushing, let's keep pushing. So we put more hours into it and we get 27.7, we get to 28.3%. We're making progress, right? Trust us, we're making progress, things are happening, we just need to invest more. So we go even further and we get up to 29%, right? We're not getting anywhere near where we need it to be in order for it to actually provide value, but we spent all that time working. And the difficulty about this is that future ROI is unknown. I don't know how many hours it's going to take to be able to turn the result from where it is to what I need, so you just essentially keep throwing money at it, time at it, resources at it. A good example of this is the non, from a non tactics blockbuster movie, uh, movies. So a few years ago, Disney released Rogue One, a Star Wars movie. They all told put in $520 million out of it, and they're going to they're get about $1.1 billion back for that. Pretty good return for a blockbuster. Now, there's this belief, this expertise belief, that pervades machine learning the same way it pervades this, which is, hey, we've done this. We know what sells. Let's do it again. So they do it again, and a couple years later, release Solo. Same company, same studios, stars, all of the things aligned, and they invest 450 million in it, and they're going to get maybe 400 million back if they're lucky. So there's this idea that you, that you have this future ROI that you're, that you're an expert. We've done this machine learning before. We've seen this problem before. We've seen the same kind of thing before. I need this amount of time to do it, right? And you sell yourself on that idea, and then you keep investing on it, and you turn yourself into the epsilon modeling situation of just pouring, pouring resources into something that's not going to work. When there's a holistic process here, which you could change and you can improve. So I was consulting with an e-commerce company a few years ago. And when I first got there, they were working on this recommendation engine. And they'd been working on the recommendation engine for about a year, and it wasn't into production. They couldn't get it to work. Uh, it wasn't providing any value to their customers at all. It wasn't changing any of the metrics that they wanted it to change. And instead of looking at, like, the data and seeing if they could get better data, if they could prove the data, if there was something else going on in their system, they were just getting fancier and fancier with their modeling. They were to the point when I got there that they were reading recent re Google research papers on recommendation engines and implementing themselves from scratch to try to epsilon model that thing just a little bit better, just, just to get it to the threshold, to just get it to the line, right? And they had spent almost a year trying to do this with no success. Ultimately, the answer was look at the other things in the platform, in the process, and not focus on the the algorithms at that point in time. The machine learning wasn't the problem. So there's this cliche that you hear all the time. When you're fundraising, it's AI. When you're hiring, it's ML. When you're implementing, it's logistic regression. And I love the quote line that everybody uses this, which is everyone on Twitter ever. And it is totally a cliche. And we often talk about it in the terms of people not understanding the difference between statistics and machine learning. But honestly, what this is saying oftentimes is that if we do everything else well, 
the logistic regression got us high enough, we didn't need to add the additional complexity to do it, right? Machine learning is, is what you, you employ when stuff, the simpler stuff doesn't work, not the first thing you go to, not the thing that you optimize around initially without looking at the whole system as a whole. So a third case is the academic exercise. This is where you do the research and development really well, uh, but you don't really do the stuff around that so well. And this one comes around a lot because machine learning is a highly interdisciplinary field. There's a lot of skills that are required to do it well. And what happens is you, you get your first hire, you bring your first person on board on the team, and they have a certain set of skills. And because we don't have a good understanding of what a holistic, successful team looks like, the, the, the way people think about it is good machine learning people are people like me. I'm gonna go hire more people like me. And so what happens is you create a selection bias and you build out a team that's missing a whole bunch of those skills. And so where you end up with is a team that's focused around that initial piece, which is we need somebody who has the skills to do machine learning, right? And not the skills around that. They don't have the support, the, the context, the additional resources and expertise to work on that whole process, and so the sides collapse, they go away. The other piece about it is that oftentimes the machine learning piece of it is the most fun, right? I mean, working on the collection process is not usually as much fun. Most people don't like to be writing the ETLs. That's not, that's not where the, the excitement is, and so uh, it's pretty easy for that to collapse down, especially if you don't have the right people with the expertise uh, focusing on that. The other way this happens is the built in the laboratory, works in the laboratory, can't survive in the wild, right? And a lot of times this happens because people are used to and trained up and learning in the academic sense on, I built it on my laptop, it works on my laptop, what happens when I wanna get it into production? And it doesn't scale. There's this idea of local development where I can take my 200,000 row example, run it, get results in 240 milliseconds, things look good, and then I should be able to transparently scale that up to 20 billion rows in production, right? And that's not a reality. There's different constraints and different concerns to be thinking about that, and you need to be building from that and understanding that from the very beginning. Common case number four, doing agile. Doing agile looks a lot like this. Uh, collection, development, and validation, you do those all right. The research, you do very poorly, but you, you're awesome at the processing and deployment. And the reason for that is, and this is often the case of the opposite when you hire the people that have much, much more skills in agile and software engineering and that kind of thing, because this kind of stuff looks good in swim lanes. It looks good on tickets. It's very, it's known, it's easy to do. You can stand next to your software engineering team and talk about things in the same exact way that you talk about it there. But data engineering is not the same thing as application engineering. If you look at an agile process and you're doing these iterations, applications can be engineered. So you can say things like, we will be able to deliver value N in iteration N. Not with 100% reliability, everybody understands that, but with high enough reliability that you can make a process out of it and use it, right? But insight cannot be engineered in the same way we might be able to deliver insight I in iteration N, we might be able to reduce false positives by 5% next week, but what I talked about before is that not knowing before you go in how much that's gonna change. So what happens is you get going and you get started and you fail enough times at doing this kind of insight-based thing and value-based deliverables turn into task-based deliverables. And essentially value-based uh, machine learning goes by the wayside. What happens is the task can be engineered. So we'll be able to say, say things like, oh yeah, we can add a new feature to the model next week. What's that gonna do? Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know, right? But it's a task, and I can put it in the ticket, and I can put story points behind it, and I can talk about it, and I can do all of that stuff, but I'm not focusing on that. So what you have to do is not engineer insight, not try to engineer insight, but engineer for insight. Engineer an environment where machine learning can be successful. Uh, Jeff Magnuson, who's the VP of Data Platform at Stitch Fix, has a really great blog on how to structure a modern data science data engineering team. 
And in it, he says, engineers must deploy platforms, services, abstractions, and frameworks that allow the data scientists to conceive of, develop, and deploy their ideas. I like to think of them in terms of Lego blocks. Engineers design new Lego blocks. The data scientists assemble in creative ways to create new data science. It's a very similar idea. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create an environment where you can increase that operational tempo and get to the point where you feel like we can pretty reliably say we can make significant improvements on insight over those periods of time, right? It's not going to ever be identical to the task type stuff that, that a feature delivers value uh, that you would see in software engineering, but you can replicate it enough to be successful. But when you don't do that, that's where the research goes by the wayside because it just feels like a black box waste of time. There's no output coming out of it. You can't see the deliverables. You're not seeing the incremental value. And so it just gets ignored. Common case number five, which all of these cases are bad, but I would say this is probably the worst. Doing everything well Of course. <laughs> Doing everything well, but not validating the results. George Box has this quote that is also pretty cliche at this point in time, but it's useful, which is, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. No matter what you do with machine learning, it's not going to be right. It's going to be some amount of wrong. And that's the mindset you want to have is you want to constantly ask yourself, how wrong is this? Not how right it is, right? How, how wrong is my machine learning? Is it wrong within an acceptable amount? Or is it too much? Because machine learning always has an answer. If you give it data, and that data doesn't, it meets all of the conditions you need from a formatting perspective, machine learning will give you an answer. You will get something back. But that doesn't mean that it's, it's a good answer or a right answer. I'm a former astrophysicist, so I thought I'd bring in uh, a solar system example. So as everybody knows, or should know in here, we live in a heliocentric solar system. The Earth revolves around the sun. All of the other planets revolve around the sun. But until the age of modern astronomy, they thought the sun and all of the other planets revolved around the Earth. It was a geocentric, egocentric way of looking at it. And it was just a bias. It was just an assumption that they made. It was their worldview. The Earth is important. That's where we are. So we'll do that. Now, you can actually map out planetary orbits in both ways. You can come up with a solution with heliocentrism on the left, and you can come up with a solution for geocentrism on the right. One of those looks a lot more complicated than the other. But they're both solutions. These are two valid solutions. If all you had was people standing on the Earth with you know, reasonably powered telescopes but not super telescopes, both of these solutions would provide the same value. They would be able to predict where you would see the planets in the sky in the future. But they're not both equally right. So. Keeping that in mind, let's go to the very real example again from before. At the end of it, I counted the number of correct answers I had, and then I printed the accuracy. I'm hoping that some people in the audience cringed when I did that. But please, please, please don't ever calculate accuracy the way I did in that example, ever. Like I said, there are you want to be looking at the model from the standpoint of how wrong am I? And accuracy is a very malleable thing uh, with a lot of problems. And this simplistic view of accuracy is almost always going to make you feel better than the reality is. Let me give you an example. So we will take this example again, and I'm going to make a change to loading the data. I'm going to load a rare event data set. And then I'm going to replace the model I had before with a model that is always false. It will just always say false, no matter what, what data we put in there. The prediction is going to be false. And I run that, and I get 95% accuracy. 
Why did I get 95% accuracy? Because true only occurs about 5% of the time in the data set. This seems like such a simple thing, but I see it so often, where people come up and they'll be like, yeah, we're getting these really great accuracies, but when you get it out there in the world, it just doesn't look, doesn't look great, doesn't work great, it's not doing what we want, we're not seeing the value we're getting out of it. And the reason for it is because most of the stuff that we want to be modeling is rare event stuff, right? We're not, we're not everything's 50-50 split, not everything's uh, simple like this, and so there are many different ways, and I'm hoping in the breakout sessions that people are gonna get into these in more detail, because I don't have time for it up here, to be looking at terms of model performance, model accuracy, model precision, all of those different things, uh, to make sure that you're doing something well. But just keep in mind that you wanna be asking yourself the question, how wrong is this? Because it's never right. So one thing we do, which I showed a little bit of here, and this is a blog post from one of the data scientists on my team, is that we mock things with rule-based uh, estimators at the beginning when we're doing things like classification. And so, Eric, my data scientist, says in the blog, creating mock models using a heuristic is an excellent way to remove bottlenecks in the development cycle, which is true. We can get things deployed very quickly with those, and then we can start working off of that. They are always also useful for establishing minimum performance necessary for a model to be valuable. For example, if the model is trying to predict which customers will leave and which will stay, then a naive model might predict that all customers will stay. While it has a high accuracy, its precision will be poor, and any viable model we make will have to improve on this performance. So this is one of those things where we take the simple based rules, mechanisms, and we push those a bit till we get to the point where we feel like we've got a good baseline. And then as we deploy our machine learning, it has to do significantly better than that to make it valuable and make it worth it, right? And those are the kinds of things to be thinking about as well. Because as I threw numbers out here, like 97% accurate, 5% accurate, 27% accurate, whatever it is, those are arbitrary values, and they're not anchored to anything. And you need to anchor it to as much as you can to make it successful and, and, and understand what you're doing. But there's also the validation stuff, which is you need more than a score, right? You need to actually understand what your model is doing. Again, we had these two valid solutions. And if you don't know anything about astronomy, you don't any, know anything about the solar system, you don't have a good way of figuring out which one of these is the actual valid one to do, right? Domain expertise in machine learning is critical, and it's a massive part of the validation process. We think about it a lot in terms of the research process in, in developing the model. We need that domain expertise to get in there. I actually gave, is that a talk that a friend gave a couple years ago on how important domain expertise was in, uh, in developing a model, and he was, he was showing it, and he was showing how you can make mistakes if you didn't understand this or you didn't understand that in your model. And at the end, the question and answer section, someone raised their hand, and they said, I get your thesis, but do you really need to have domain expertise to be able to deploy a machine learning model? Because honestly, at my job, I have no idea what our data does, and I'm just doing it all day long. And my friend was just like, oh, <laughs> right? Because this is one of those things where it seems pretty simple again, it seems pretty obvious, but there's still persistence, there's still stuff going on uh, all over the place with, where this isn't appreciated. But when you take domain expertise and you add it on to the end, what you're talking about here, and I like this quote from uh, an opinion article in Wired a few years ago, which is that for big data to mature beyond marketing hype towards truly transformative solutions, it must grow up out of the computer science that gave birth to it and spend more time on understanding the domain-specific problems it is applied to than on the computing algorithms that operationalize them. This isn't to say that those algorithms aren't important. It isn't to say that the investment that, that machine learning engineers make to develop and improve those aren't important. But it's very easy to make those things the important thing at the expense of the other. And so I'll skip the examples today, but they are all over the place of uh, companies that have deployed machine learning models in the, in the real world and have had all kinds of crazy consequences that they didn't expect, right? There's books on this, there's podcasts on this, you can go anywhere, you can basically throw a rock, a digital rock, into the web and you'll hit an example of, of this type of stuff happening. So there's a lot more to the validation than just, I got this score, right? It's also being able to decompose and break it in and understand exactly what kind of consequences the automated decision making that you've deployed is doing. 
So we spend a whole bunch of time at that at when I work, when we get a model out there, uh, just breaking it down, understanding it in all these different ways, trying to make sure that what we're doing is, is having the effect that we wanted it to have. And I go back to this e-commerce company, again, that was working on this recommendation engine uh, that I talked about earlier. I was talking to their marketing department uh, while I was trying to help them out and, and get things back online. And they told me this story about how one of their data scientists had spent a month on what he thought was gonna be the breakthrough in uh, the recommendation engine. They weren't gonna be able to apply it to all of their products, but they were gonna be able to apply it to the fashion area. We're gonna be able to, to do this really well in the fashion area. We found some really great correlations, some really great predictive results in this fashion era area. And the marketing person was telling me that she was excited, she was waiting for the results. He finally brought her the results and they showed that. And what he had found was that there were these correlations between brand labels. Brand A meant you would probably buy something from brand B. Brand C meant you'd probably buy something from brand D. And when she looked at them, it turned out the parent companies were the same for all of the brand labels that were correlations. They were essentially just discount marketing versus high level marketing on the same fashion. They were the same clothes. So again, there was this lack of domain expertise, but the score was great and the data scientists got very, very excited and came to the marketing department like, this is gonna be the win we need. And it turned out to be completely meaningless and completely useless because any marketer there already knew that if they like this brand, they're gonna like that brand because they're the same, they're just two labels in the same brand. So, wrapping it up, the ideal scenario is to do all of these well, right? Uh, another blog piece that I'm gonna push for one of the data engineers on my team because I like the way he says this, is that one of the biggest reasons that I believe we succeed in managing all of our many projects is our commitment to our practice. To not only focus on the final results we deliver, but also on the path we take to deliver them. That idea that that whole holistic process matters, and that we're constantly trying to look for the lowest hanging fruit and improve that. And that machine learning lives in there, but it is not all of that. So with all of that in mind, put all of that together, what is the machine learning Joel test? What are those 12 questions? I don't know. I don't have them, but I think about them all the time. And I hope to someday figure out what those are. But here's what I do know. Dot fit, dot predict is not sufficient. That's not machine learning, right? That's the very basic thing you could do. That's the five minute YouTube video to show you how to do it. But it doesn't talk about machine learning at all. It doesn't show you how to put it into the real world. And ultimately machine learning is a powerful set of tools but they require a holistic approach to use effectively. Otherwise, we're not building anything that has any value. We're just doing it for an exercise. And that's my talk, thank you. You uh, talked about uh, alerts and alarms and responding to those very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it necessary to respond quickly? Uh, so there's a couple pieces of that. One is immutability. Uh, so the, the, the general idea is that we don't want to be going back and rewriting history. Uh, every time you do that, when you, when you mess up essentially your data history, it becomes a branch somewhere. It becomes an if else, right? Some, some way you have to deal with the fact that the data wasn't correct. Uh, and we don't want to be losing data. So if, data's not, if, if the data isn't meeting our standards, it's going into the quarantine. A quarantine is, the general way you work with a quarantine is it's never recoverable. A quarantine is essentially just a, a dead letter uh, that you eventually wipe out uh, at different intervals. And we throw stuff in the quarantine purely for us to help quickly figure out what's wrong and repair it. But anytime anything's wrong, we're essentially losing signal. Uh, and what we, what we want is to el eliminate the amount of time that we're losing some signal, because all of our signals are important in different things. And, uh, you know, from a machine learning perspective, that may, be, that may be key. That may be one of the features that has a really high importance in something we're doing. And so that we're, as, we're, as we're making decisions off of that, with that signal gone, we've essentially lost the power we have. And then the, the business is operating on uh, much less intelligence than it would have if that signal's there. And when you're doing machine learning and this kind of stuff, we're using a lot of features. We're using a lot of data in, in, at once. And so, it's very hard to tell exactly what the impact is every time we have those. 
And so basically what you want to do is you just want to minimize the impact of any, any type of signal loss at all. If it, if it goes on for any period of time, then what you have to do is you have to start investing the time to figure out what the impact of that is and how we're going to deal with it and how you're going to use it going forward. Because you have, especially with the kind of stuff we do, we do short-term machine learning stuff, things that are happening right now that are telling us how things are behaving at the moment. But we also have machine learning algorithms that are training on two months or three months of historical data to tell us what trends are going to be looking like uh, upcoming, right? And so if we lose that signal in time, the short-term stuff may be bad for a little bit and then recover, but then the long-term stuff we have has to resolve the fact that it doesn't have that signal for that period of time. Uh, and so one of the things that I did, and this is one of those things to be really cognizant of when you're starting a, a data team, is that uh, there's this idea in the, in the software world, essentially, which is essentially move fast and break stuff. We can always fix it in the next version, right? But the problem is, is that when you do that with data, the organization very quickly loses trust in that data. And when you lose trust in, a, in, a, in an organization, you can't run a data-driven organization. If you imagine the meeting where you have a bunch of execs sitting down and every exec has their opinion. We, I should, we should do this, we should do that, right? I think my way's better, you think your way's better. The way modern companies deal with that, and that's kind of one of the things that Google really pushed in the early 2000s was, I don't care what your opinion is, I care what the data says, show me the data. And as soon as people stop trusting the data, then that conversation goes back to, well, I don't buy that data. I don't believe it, right? It's been wrong too many times before. So I'm gonna just focus on my opinion, right? That's gonna matter more. And so when you're doing machine learning, you have that, you either have that contract with your customer or your user, or you have that contract with some internal party, whether it's the people in the company or whatever, right? If everyone can think about the, like, I got onto something and I saw ads for something that was totally meaningless to me, right? Like, I know that's a targeted ad. Boy, that does not apply to me, right? Contract lost, right? Trust lost, belief lost that they can do it well. In those kinds of cases, it doesn't matter as much. But especially when you're trying to provide a product, in our case, where we're trying to, you know, make sure that employees are scheduling and working well and those kinds of things, we have a pretty strong relationship with those employees, and there's a belief that what we're doing is providing them value. And if they see that as a not signal, it, it gets pretty bad pretty fast. So both internally from a data-driven company perspective and externally, it really matters to make sure that that signal remains strong. So we try to respond as quickly as possible. And so we, would, we alert on that in exactly the same way uh, we alert on infrastructure going down, right? Like if, if we start having an outage on one of our databases, the same alerting process that goes to manage that to get our DevOps team running in high gear to resolve that, we do the exact same thing with our data uh, and all of those streams. We treat them as just, just as mission critical as that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>